there. Welcome back to the latest in our series of DCD Talks, the video interview series for the data center industry. I'm Dan Loosemore, CMO at DCD, and I'll be guiding you through this latest installment. I'm delighted to be joined by a friend of DCD, Peter Sacco, president at PTS Data Center Solutions, and Jamie Funk, sales director uh, for data centers and many other verticals at Bloom Energy. Uh, Jamie, Peter, thanks for being with us for this latest edition. The sun here in London is shining, the pubs are reopening, the barbers are about to reopen, and uh, we're going full steam ahead into summer with a bit of luck. The vaccines are finally rolling out. How are things going for you guys? Jamie, maybe I'll come to you first. Uh, for anyone less familiar with Bloom, maybe you can give us a little bit of context there and bring us up to speed on what's been going on in the last 12 months or so. Sure. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting us on, Dan. Um, we uh, I'm out here in the the Bay Area, uh, just south of San Francisco, and we've been fortunate to have an early spring here. So we've had the sun out for for quite uh, quite a while now, um, and life is coming back to normal. Um, we're obviously not there yet, but you're starting to see restaurants open up and uh, museums are starting to have some limited capacity. So it does feel like. Uh, life is beginning to come back and, and maybe I'll be able to leave this uh, eight by eight uh, cube in the top of my house where I've been sitting for the last, uh, I guess, 13 months now at this stage. Um, for those that don't know Bloom, uh, we are a solid oxide fuel cell company. Um, we've actually been around for nearly 20 years, uh, although there's been substantial growth over the last 10, which is when we really commercialized the product. Um, and we do on-site power generation. So we put fuel cells at your facility that make cleaner, more reliable, um, and more cost-effective and predictable power than, than the electric grid. So it's got great applicability in mission-critical environments, both in traditional data centers and, and edge environments as well. So excited to talk a little bit more about it um, in the discussion today. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Peter, welcome back. We, we're used to being on the more formal presentation platform. So great That's you fine. can come and join us in the virtual talk studio. Uh, how's life treating you, sir? Yeah, thanks, Dan. First of all, I want to comment. I, I, I think it's funny that your role of priorities was sun came out, pubs are opening, and then hair. And so I, I think that's great. But you know what? We're having unseasonably good weather here as well. And I think it's a good metaphor for the times, right? Because uh, dare I say it's not over, but we can all see the light at the end of the tunnel, thankfully, right now. Um, as far as how we, uh, you know, we were resilient as a corporation as well. We've been in business for 20 years as well. We're a design builder of um, things, buildings, especially data centers. But we also operate data centers and have a managed IT business. And because of that, we were considered critical industry right from the beginning. And so, dare I say, my people have been here for, for the duration, uh, through the good and the bad. So it's been a little tough. We've had probably at our peak 20% still working in the office, 20% on job sites or in data centers or at customer sites, and then the, the balance working from home. And we had always been kind of that way. Um, so it was a little bit much more of the same. But I get it. We're all having that groundhog moment where it feels like every day goes in. So thanks for asking. Um, we're seeing business open up for sure right now. Um, um, but we had a pretty uh, strong, thankfully, uh, 2020 as well. Cool. Did you want to add that point, oh. Pete? Because oh, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and speaking of the pandemic, you know, one of the um, great stories that I love through the pandemic um, was the fact that Bloom um, actually was able to deploy its power to hospital facilities, roll up or tent hospitals facilities very quickly. Jamie, maybe you could tell that story because that was a great story um, about how Bloom can deploy very quickly if needed to. Yeah, yeah, it, it was um, a, uh, a really interesting um, and exciting opportunity for us. Early in the pandemic, Governor Newsom out here in California realized that there was the potential for the hospitals to be overwhelmed and wanted to get ahead of it by setting up uh, some pop-up um, uh, expansion hospital facilities uh, and connected with with our CEO and and asked if if we could do something quickly and with the support of the governor to kind of uh, brush away a lot of the permitting um, headaches that can delay delay projects we were able to spin up a microgrid in seven days for a 
pop-up hospital that the state built at the Sleep Train Arena up in Sacramento, um, which uh, was a great project to be uh, a part of and, and shows how quickly we can get our equipment in the ground when you've got all the, all the entities working together to make it happen. That's a great story, Jamie. I, I love it because, you know, it speaks not just to the resiliency of Bloom as a corporation, but I think it's us as a people, right? When we as a nation of people or excuse me, a world of people have our back up against the wall like we have in this pandemic, um, we come up with the solutions that it takes to keep the world moving along. And uh, and I think we'll um, it's a testament, a good example of, of, of that. You know, and it, it speaks to why we're partners today. I mean, you know, as you guys evolved into that and, uh, you know, and you were seeking a partner in the design builder world like PTS that was going around. And I knew a lot of your executives from the beginning and and we started working together. You know, it's really been a good uh, a good relationship. You know, like I mentioned, PTS is a design builder of data centers. You know, we've got architects and engineers and construction people. But I started thinking about um, what is going to be the evolution of the data center with what we're seeing with data center strategy right now. And what we're seeing is the evolution of the data center strategy of edge data center plus regional data center, call it an exchange data center if we're going to use the Gartner language, and then cloud in its very many forms, right? And what we're seeing amongst corporations today is saying, look, I'm cloud first. I'm just not cloud only. And so I use the idea of the relationship with Bloom um, to further the edge. I, I call it the data center facility reimagined. I'm sure we're going to explore it today deep, deeply further as to the why. But at the heart of it, um, it comes down to that we take their solid oxide fuel cell, use it as the primary side power for our data centers, which gives us a whole bunch of benefits, which I'd love to talk about. Great. Well, let's dive in. I mean, maybe maybe I can start by just just reframing some of the some of the problems we're solving here. And maybe the pandemic's a good springboard to that. The Microsoft CEO came out and said that they did two two months worth of digital trans uh, two years worth of digital transformation in two months. Right, we're seeing this increased proliferation of data everywhere. A high cost of failure. What what problems are we solving here? What are, what are you guys seeing in terms of those? those drivers from the data center perspective. Maybe I'll come to you first on that, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, I would say there, there, are, there are a number of different drivers. I mean, I'd echo what Pete had said, that the expansion in data center capacity that's happening right now is, is uh, tremendous, both in traditional colo and hyperscale and at some of the, the edge expansion that is beginning to grow. And, you know, what we are hearing in the market is, is a few different uh, things. So one, you're starting to see more long duration outages, right? Between uh, what just happened in Dallas with the deep freeze or the flooding in Houston a few years ago, you know, Hurricane Sandy a long time ago in, in New York, the rolling blackouts in California, you're starting to have this just regular multi-day um, outages. Think about what happened in Puerto Rico, where traditional generators yeah maybe they're they're going to support you for two days three days but then you start running into fuel shortages you start running into um uh overheating and, and maintenance challenges so we're hearing a lot of folks that are looking for uh, a solution that can island them for long durations you know four five six days in a row and, and a fuel cell which is always on and a, a solid state chemical reaction is really well designed for that you're also seeing um, utilities have a, a difficult time meeting this demand. So there are our customers coming to us and saying, hey, the utility can't get the power I need for my expansion for three plus years. Um, and I got to grow faster than that. So having your own on-site power plant can allow you to um, solve that problem. There's uh, crackdowns or tightening on air permitting around generators in Europe and California and elsewhere that's making it Maybe not exactly today, but it's making people think long term. I may need to think about a world where I can no longer use diesel generators, and and what technologies can can help me help me get there. Um, and then lastly, I'd say that this this edge expansion. There are a lot of folks that are putting, um, you know, however you want to define it, smaller data centers in facilities they already own, and they're not really interested in in 
being responsible for traditional generators and UPS. They're looking for a clean, highly reliable solution that they can just pay for like the, the utility, except get the power quality and resiliency that their operations uh, need. So um, even though it's been a challenging year overall with the pandemic, there's been a lot of kind of tailwinds around power resiliency, sustainability, cost control that that has allowed us to continue to grow pretty, uh, pretty substantially. Thanks, Jamie. I'm just going to do the classic host thing here and say for more about the uh, Texas Big Freeze, we've just released the latest edition of DCD Quarterly and you can download it here. <laughs> uh, Pete, over to you on this one. How do you see these drivers? Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect. So when I was the Bloom, uh, the, the Bloom product is a cornerstone of, uh, you know, my future proof data center approach, you know, that we're constantly evolving and it really offers three things power resiliency and scalability, um, the ability to produce a, a, a product uh, that it costs less to build and costs less to operate. And then lastly, one that's sustainable uh, because it's becoming important to the planet, right? For all of the reasons that Jamie just said about it's getting harder for the traditional utility to do all of these things, then combine that with the, not just the fact that the hyperscale guys are growing, uh, hugely in footprint, but everybody's you know evolving. We're about to see the IoT world explode with 5G and uh, the proliferation of data centers from the co-location. We're, you know, all of the cloud providers are talking about AWS outposts and Azure stacks where they want performance at the edge. That's enterprise deploying edge. And so we're looking for how we can, you know, we look for of how would I accomplish getting uh, resiliency, lower cost, and sustainability all at the same time. And Bloom filled that for all of us. It operates better than the local utility with greater reliability. I can actually expand the Bloom stack without taking it offline for maintenance and without taking it offline to increase its capacity and or redundancy. I forego all of the capital cost of buying vast amounts of extra infrastructure from utility switch gear, transfer switches, generators, fuel systems, uh, UPSs, by using the fuel cell system as my primary side power for all of my critical loads, all of my essential loads, and in fact, all of my building loads all of the time, like Jamie said, all power on, always on power, I then get the power resiliency I need by if I'm following the Uptime Institute guidance of how I get to tier three and tier four, I now have a gas powered solid oxide fuel cell that is creating electricity and diversely I could then use utility and generators to provide that second path of power that's critical for um, overall resiliency and all and I'm doing it and I'm paying for it not as a capex but I can we can do it as an opex just like you would buy utility um, by putting it in a PPP instrument and so uh, that is, uh, that's the great advantage of it. And then by the way, all of that always on power, that lower is done sustainably with no appreciable, um, um, uh, excessive water use, no particulate emissions, no, you know, emissions. I mean, Jamie, you could speak, you know, all day to the sustainability functionality of it, since it's become an ever maybe give people a, pr a primer on, on, on the sustainability aspects of the fuel cell. Sure. Yeah, there, there's a there's there's really four benefits overall when it comes to sustainability. So one, we don't combust the fuel. So when you don't combust the fuel, you have no NOx, SOx, mercury, benzene, any of the air particulates that you get from coal or natural gas. Um, and there was a recent study that was out saying it was hard to believe, but it was one in five deaths across the world is tied to air quality. Um, and uh, and combustion power plants are a, a big source of that. Um, we don't have any combustion. That also makes it quiet and, and easier to permit with, with, with cities because we're not exploding fuel, so you don't have the, the noise and you don't have the air emissions. Um, two is uh, we don't use any water. So um, we use a little bit of water at startup, but once under operation, uh, there's, there's no water consumed. And when you look at uh, combustion or nuclear, the, the water consumption is substantial. 
Um, three, on the, the carbon front, uh, many of our customers do run on natural gas. So there is some carbon associated with it. But the way I like to describe it is we're a Toyota Prius. Um, because we are making the, the power on site and you're using it, you know, 100 feet from where it's made, um, and it's a one-step chemical reaction, um, depending where you are in the, the country, it's anywhere from 20 to 60% less carbon per unit than a traditional you know, natural gas or, or coal power plant. So um, we're always on as well. So when you start to think about the amount of carbon that you are offsetting by running 24 hours a day uh, at uh, a, a better efficiency than the grid, it really adds up. Um, and then lastly, we are fuel flexible. So we can run on pure hydrogen, we can run on biogas. Um, as those fuels get more cost competitive, I think you'll see the adoption of it uh, increase and have us be part of the zero carbon um, future. We also have uh, solid oxide uh, technology is really well situated for carbon capture um, in a way that combustion is not. So that zero carbon roadmap uh, and the ability for us to play into that is is really exciting. Uh, and I think you're seeing that momentum and um, progress on getting those renewable or zero carbon fuels coming out of the EU with their electrolyzer uh, commitment starting to come out of Biden's, you know, infrastructure plans and the most recent um, stimulus bill. I mean, you're seeing it in South Korea. So there is starting to be a lot of governmental movement saying wind and solar is great, but you know, batteries alone aren't gonna aren't gonna shift solar. Yeah, maybe you can get it to the night, but you really need seasonal shifting. How yeah. are you gonna shift summer solar to the winter when you've got seven less hours of sunlight? Um, so there are a lot of those structural things that I think people are really starting to get their arms around uh, and looking at fuel cells as being a key component to deep decarbonization. And, and Dan, here's why I love it now, because it's available now. It's been around for 20 years. The, ten, the, the, the big growth has come in the last 10, but it's available now. I mean, look, you know, I love what Bill Gates has been running around saying, you know, in that the documentary Inside Bill's Brain, when he talked about, look, proliferation of using... Uh, nuclear again and in fact he just got his approvals to do these miniature nuclear you know sites and and the idea is to put power generation closer to the load because that's what's going to happen in the very near future well guess what we don't need old spent fuel rods as a fuel source for the you know for building nuclear fuel source we have a multi-fuel uh, approach to generating power right now right at our fingertips that could be done today not tomorrow and that's why I think it, it's ready for um, the prime time of it. It will become the standard um, for all yeah. of the reasons that Jamie just said. And I would just add one one thing, because I am pretty pretty passionate about this. You know, when you look at why the United States has been able to reduce carbon over the last um, you know 10, 15 years, I don't have the exact stats at, at my fingertips, but it isn't the proliferation of, of wind and solar. They're great technologies. They, they absolutely should continue to grow and be part of the solution. But the big change is by replacing coal plants with natural gas plants. And if you can replace natural gas plants with natural gas fuel cells, you get a further significant reduction while the rest of the technologies that get us to zero continue to evolve. And um, I know some people think natural gas is a, a, a bad word today. and we got to go all, you know, renewables tomorrow. But I think when you really dive into what it takes to keep the lights on, have it be resilient power and make a, a big chunk out of carbon, deploying natural gas fuel cells today is a powerful uh, way to make significant steps to these 2030 carbon reduction goals. And as hydrogen and biogas and these other fuels come about uh, and carbon capture develops, it's going to be the technology that helps get us to zero carbon by, you know, the 2050 um, Paris goals. So it's an exciting future, but no one should even think twice about putting in a natural gas fuel cell today. It makes a, a big impact in, in carbon reduction. And Jamie, don't you agree? It could even be, sorry, Dan, I can see your lips move there. You, did you want to interject there? We're no, rolling now. I, yeah, uh, I was probably going to do my naive marketing thing, but um, <laughs> let, let me put this to you. We've talked about sort of, three key points around resiliency, around sustainability, around cost. And 
what I'm hearing from you guys is actually the, the technology is ready. So technology maturity here is, is, is no longer an issue. So ha, in terms of rolling this out, in terms of the scalability, the thing that I can hear is, yeah, but diesel is cheap, right? It's been cheap and it's, and it's been the sort of de facto norm for, for data centers across the globe. So you guys have got quite a unique model here in terms of business modeling around the cost to reduce that capex. Maybe we should speak to that a little bit and dive in around the cost conundrum and how this plays out against what I guess historically has been a more challenging competitive drawback. Sure. Why don't I, why don't I start by talking about some of the industries that really, you know, uh, need to start considering this. If you're sitting in a facility that is doing anything seven by 24, where you have an appreciable amount of power that is consumed on a seven by 24 basis. So what are we talking about? Well, data center for sure, right? Because data center is a very large one that runs on a seven by 24. But if you're a hospital, if you're a telecommunications company, if you're a manufacturing company, a distribution company, if you have people and or technology that is running on a seven by 24 basis, we don't even want to come in and change you to just using our fuel source. This could be a component of an overall microgrid, microgrid technology to leverage whatever is in your local community that goes really well. Maybe you're sitting in Southern California where the sun is shining. Surely doesn't happen here in New Jersey that often. Nonetheless, London for that. For that. But if you're sitting in California where you have tons of sunlight, you know what? Then maybe PV you know, can be used in a microgrid combination with utility, with, you know, whatever the technology and, uh, in, in including, a high, you know, uh, uh, natural gas. That's where I think the power is going to come in is that we have a technology right in the forefront now that could leverage the locality of where we are to microgrid those capabilities to provide power resiliency, a lower cost of ownership and the sustainability, but leveraging what the availability of the market across those verticals that are our seven by 24 in nature. Now, what I love about it is to speak to the cost, the cost really comes to this. And I always say this in my presentations, if you're gonna remember anything, remember this, here's how you get lower cost, use less stuff, right? If I use less infrastructure to achieve resiliency, redundancy, and all of those things, I, it costs less to design. I can design less things on paper, less to design. If it costs less to design, it's gonna cost less to buy because there's less things to buy. If there's less things to buy, it costs less to construct because there's less things to integrate and to get to work together. And if all of that is less, it's less to maintain because I don't need um, you know, the experts to know all the intricacies of integration and there's less things to fix. So build with less stuff. And then that's how we're get, you know, getting here. And I think the industries that are going to be the, have already been, I'm not even going to say the first, the ones where we're having the greatest success right now are those people who have seven by 24 operating facilities and they don't have to wait for whatever the next great nuclear proliferation is going to be. It's going to be what's in front of them today. How do we leverage natural grass, which is highly distributed? How we leverage the future hydrogen economy? How do we leverage existing PV and be able to deploy it all in a microgrid situation to be not just the seven by 24 power to operate a facility, but the resilient power you need that if you want to bring edge operations to that site as well, you can now have, what, again, what tier three, four we look for is highly resilient multi-source power to the edge of my facility to be able to operate IT with levels of uh, predictable availability like never before achieved. And, and Pete, let me build on that a, a little bit. Here's the big difference, Dan. A diesel generator you buy and you hope you never have to use it. It sits in idle and, it, and you test it once a month uh, and then you cross your fingers when the power goes out that it's going to turn on. A fuel cell is always on. We are not a backup device or at least a solid oxide fuel cell. We are your primary source of power. Yep. We are up and running and we are making kilowatt hours. So when you think about the economics, it's not just what's the upfront cost of a fuel cell versus a generator. Because yes, we are substantially more expensive. It's what's the total cost of the power I no longer have to buy from the utility plus the generators or UPSs I don't have to buy, plus the losses I no longer have on my UPS, plus the, the maintenance that I, I don't have to have. Um, and 
can you through a fuel cell, which we mostly finance through PPAs and managed service agreements, can we deliver you a cost of, per kilowatt hour that is cheaper than that total package? And in many markets today, we can. We're not we're not cost competitive everywhere. The the cheaper the cost of electricity, the harder it is for us to compete on a pure dollars perspective. But when you start to factor in the ease of use and operation, um, you see people that are willing to pay that premium. Um, and I'll wow. give you one example. There's a there's a large um, telecom network equipment manufacturer that was building a new uh, facility out here in the, the Bay Area, consolidating a, a number of sites that they had acquired through acquisition. And they you know, needed to build a, um, a, a, a IT lab that had resilient power in, in San Jose. And um, the thought to them of trying to permit generators in California, find the space next to the neighbors with the noise, be able to squeeze the, the UPS indoors. They said, we just can't do it. Um, so we ended up putting a fuel cell deployment on just the top of their parking garage outside and creating a, a highly reliable uh, environment for uh, for their IT labs to operate in um, and eliminate that traditional infrastructure all through a cost per kilowatt hour uh, contract that was you know more effective than the utility grid. No, amazing, Pete. You were gonna, uh, I think, dive in with some of those real world use cases as well. Yeah, you? you know, you you were. You, whenever we start talking, right, it gets my juices flowing about the use cases as to how many places this is fits. But remember, I, I'm going to stick to it and I'm going to keep it in the context of that edge because that's where we're seeing most of the activity right now. How do I get my IT compute as close to where it's being used, right? So in terms of pure IT, I want to keep, if my data is being created and consumed on site, I want to get all of my resources as close to that as possible. Well, how better else can I do that that I now have, I could go into inner city downtown London. And if you told me to build a data center in downtown London, impossible. We do not have the space to be able to do that. But if we could build vertically, and if we could build vertically and put a fuel cell, you know, adjacent to the building that doesn't take up a lot of space or, you know, or on the building, we could actually power that building always on from an alternate fuel source stack it high as a data center, and now I have that load connected to as close to the people who are consuming that and using that as possible. And so, you know, the world, she's always changing. And I think that that's the next thing that we're seeing is how do I get everything closer to where people are actually using it? And uh, the ability and the flexibility that we have here by using the fuel cell uh, is like never before, it allows me to get closer and closer to the actual data consumption. Thanks, Pete. I'm going to do a quick other shout out. We are indeed seeing massive proliferation at the edge. DCD has just recorded its second annual DCD Building the Edge event. To view any session on demand, click here. Uh, that brings us on to, to really some future gazing. Pete, I know you speak. Uh, passionately around the data center reimagined. So maybe you can share with our audience how you see that. Are we diesel generator lists? What is that facility of the future in your view? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm speaking about it a lot already as the bloom being a big part of that. Um, and it, and is the bigger part because as Jamie has brought out, I am not relying on a bunch of infrastructure that sits idle unless it's needed. I'm actually operating all of my power 100% of the time for both the critical load as well as the standard operating facility all of the time through the fuel cell. And then if I want the power resiliency of tier three, tier four, then I can bring in generators and UPSs that sit standby, which by the way, only are used in the case of an absolute failure, um, which I haven't seen happen yet, but they could be the belts to the suspenders, if you will. Um, but then in the data center facility, reimagine we have to do the same thing, the same concept of how do I do how do I do cooling with less infrastructure? And there we've really embraced indirect evaporative cooling. And, and in our previous webinar series that we were, we were talking about there, to me, the advantage is of how do I get rid of cooling towers, chillers, pump systems, monitoring systems, um, all the tons of pieces that are very complex jigsaw puzzle to put together and eliminate it to a single box that will actually 
to give me an indirect uh, uh, airstream, meaning rejecting heat outside and cooling the air inside without combining airstreams, while at the same time providing um, a DX air cooled trimming if need be, or free cooling and, um, and or evaporative adiabatic cooling all in a singular box, one box that does everything. When I combine the Bloom solution with that IDEX solution, I get a very powerful data center solution that costs less to build and costs less to operate. And I can put it, stack it vertically and put it where the loads are, the people, the, the technology of where it's gonna be needed. And that, that, that's the overall vision of where we're talking to people and evolving the data center yet again. And you, know, you said future gazing, look, it's just the beginning. We're living now in a world of you know, blockchain and cryptocurrencies and IoT, that the things that we can only imagine, think back this 100 years ago, what we looked like compared to, right? My parents, their mystical technology was radio and television. And now we have the proliferation of the internet. And that seemed like this all pervasive centralized data thing. What is it going to look like 20 years from now? Who knows what it's going to look like from now? All I know is I'm setting up PTS for the next 20 years to whatever it's going to be is going to demand that we can put the massive levels of compute, the massive levels of power that will be required in connectivity. We're coming up ways now to design it to put that closer to where the facilities that will be using the data and creating the power need to be. And so that's why it's such a big part of our uh, my future strategic vision. Thanks, Pete. Exciting times. To watch the full presentation uh, that Peter Sacco gave in the most recent webinar, the Data Centre Reimagined, you can watch on demand here. Um, Jamie, over to you for the for the final word on this. What's next for Bloom Energy? How, how do you see things moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been I've been fortunate to be with Bloom for almost 11 years now and have seen the, uh, the company grow from having about five uh, megawatts in the ground when I started to well over 500 and, and hopefully by the end of this year, um, I think our CFO is on record of saying we should be at about a billion in sales. So the company has grown dramatically over that decade, but I really think we're, we're just getting warmed up. Um, you know, you think about combustion engines that they have been tinkered with and improved on for how many years now, 150, 200 years. Um, Solid oxide fuel cells have really been in commercial development now for a little over 10, 12 years. Uh, and the roadmap that we have in terms of getting denser, more efficient, more fuel flexible, uh, really being able to take advantage of excess renewables and run our fuel cell in reverse through a regenerative process to make hydrogen and, and become an electrolyzer product. Um, I really just think you're gonna continue to see the power density improve much like semiconductor chips, maybe not at that, you know, year and a half clip, but at something that is, is way more uh, attractive than what you're seeing in battery density. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're about to be able to fit 750 kilowatts and the footprint that we had uh, in hundred kilowatts when, when I first started it at Bloom and we roll out our next generation here. So you're going to continue to see that happen. Um, that to uh, what Pete was saying, you know, you need less material to go into the system. You're gonna you're gonna have less cost, which opens up more markets, which drives more volume through the uh, through the supply chain, which allows you to get into, you know, we're, we have a partnership with Samsung on developing fuel cells for uh, heavy uh, shipping to take advantage of uh, LNG and and the burgeoning hydrogen market. Um, you're you're gonna see further. Uh, true islanded microgrids, um, where you're taking advantage of solar that's there, some battery storage, some fuel cells running on some type of um, fuel source, whether it's natural gas or on-site biodigesters, and really cut the cord from the grid. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, it's an exciting time. You know, I think there's one thing we've learned in the power industry: it it doesn't move as quickly as as say the software world. But when you stand back and look over five, 10 years, it's pretty amazing the transformation that's happening. What you're hearing out of the government agencies now is a real commitment to accelerate that transformation because we need to. The existing electric grid infrastructure 
was built during the Eisenhower era and uh, it just hasn't been invested in and hanging copper wires in the sky that are, you know, decades old that are now getting pummeled by stronger storms just isn't a recipe for reliable power for the decades to, to come as uh, you continue to see stronger and stronger storms. So taking advantage of what Pete's saying of putting the power production next to where it's consumed um, and, and allowing folks to take control of both their carbon story and their resiliency needs uh, is going to be a trend that you you see uh, grow over the next decade. So um, we're, we're pretty enthused about it and, uh, and can't wait to continue to play our role and help them uh, help them make it happen. Hey, Dan, can I paint a picture for you? You know, I, I, I love I, I love pictures. Tony Siva, a Stanford professor, a few years ago did a, a TED talk and it was very impactful to me. And he tells a great story in there. He shows a picture of the 1900 Easter Parade, New York City, picture down Broadway. And there's nothing but horses as far as the eye can see. And he says, find the car. Right. And then you all felt struggle to find it. And then he circles the car. And then he puts up the 1909 Easter Parade, New York City, same view, same street. He says, find the horse, right? And it's cars as far as the eye could see. So it was the power of the disruptive technology that happened. We're at an inflection point right now. We've been talking about sustainable energy and proliferation of distributed energy and solutions for a long time. The technologies are mature. We are at that inflection point right now. We will see more innovation and change in the next decade than we have seen um, ever before. And so I just wanted to paint that picture because if that could happen from 1900 to 1909, before the internet, before massive media, before we, you know, everything was proliferated, it happened because people desired it to be so at the right point in time. It was 10 times cheaper, 10 times faster to own a car than to own a horse. Well, guess what? We're at that same inflection point. It's going to be time that we are proliferate energy at the edge, data at the edge in a distributed nature rather than a centralized nature. And that will happen at warp speed as it gets started. Love the parallel. Thank you, guys. It's exciting times indeed. Uh, here at DCD, we'd agree with you. In fact, we've just launched the DCD grid scale event. It's the first annual one. Uh, our friends at Bloom Energy are supporting it, in fact, coming up in just a few weeks on DCD. So if you're not registered for that yet, again, find the link below. Join us at DCD Grid Scale, the next virtual conference in this series. Um, as for today, Peter, Jamie, thanks ever so much for being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, looking forward to seeing how it all shifts over the years to come and the ongoing partnership with Bloom here on DCD. Big thanks for uh, taking part in this series. Thanks, Dan. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Jamie, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, enjoy the discussion. Take care, guys. Real good. Thank you. Bye.